Well, uh, good morning, everybody. What an honor to actually open uh, open the TED uh, TED talks in Graz here, especially at, uh, at this very uh, beautiful location. Green dreams, black growth. Uh, actually, I've stolen this quote. It's actually from uh, Fatih Birol, the uh, the chief economist of the International Energy Agency. And it actually uh, tells us a little bit about uh, two things. First of all. We have high aspirations as society to do something about the looming climate change which is affecting us all, the green dreams. And yet in the background there is uh, very bad news, which you, I'm sure, have also followed, saying that it's not all going uh, the, into the right direction. That's why black growth. And I'm trying to explore with you why is it that with all of the best intentions we're still uh, causing into troubled waters. And I. My aspiration for this talk is actually to make you think differently when you go out of here about energy and to maybe nudge you into some new perspectives. Ah, I need a clicker as well. Huh? Uh, so, look at, uh, if we look at some of the news flows out there, one could get very depressed. And if I look at that slide, I've made that 15 years ago and used it 15 years ago for the first time. And the headlines of terrorism, diseases, uh, disasters and pollution are still the same. It looks like we have been in stasis and nothing much has actually happened. Uh, also, uh, when I look at this slide, uh, we, we're still uh, fighting with uh, the problems of CO2 emissions, climate change, and we just had a financial crisis in 2008. So, what does it tell us? It tells us that we are actually in, if I look at futurists and what they say, we're at the beginnings of a huge phase of transformation of societal, technical, economical aspects. And we're just at the very beginning of that, which will take us far into uh, 2100. And we're struggling with some of these transitions because transitions are never easy. If anybody here believes that we will get a renewable energy system uh, easily without any problems, he's very, very mistaken. The same way we will not actually uh, be able to combat things like terrorism without shedding a lot of blood on the way to get there. It's in the history of mankind we've seen the transitions are always very, very difficult. Where are we actually in the energy system? Let's give you uh, a global perspective. And it's very important when you talk about energy to understand perspective. If you think about energy, you might think as people from Styria, from Austria, but there is a larger world out there. I know that Austrians have always a problem understanding that. There is a world out there, trust me. Uh, and it actually impacts what you do. It didn't matter in the 70s what the world thought. We were this island, as our prime minister said. But today, what happens out there in energy uh, matters very, very much how you feel and what you should think about this. So the Austrian perspective might not be uh, the one which actually determines where the energy system is going. We only rule this key piece, but not energy. So, what is happening right now? Well, first of all, I think you need to realize we have 1.2 billion people which have no access to energy whatsoever. You don't feel that in your daily life, but they're out there. And we cannot leave them behind. We have to do something for them, because without energy they have no chance of development. A lot of these people, of course, live in Asia, Africa, and South America. We've got 2.6 billion people with, who cannot cook properly. You might think that's not a big deal. Well, 60,000 women die every year because paraffin uh, cooking stoves explode. And that is a big deal, I would say, 60,000 lives lost, which is unnecessary. The global population grows from 7 to 9.3 billion. We just heard a study from the United Nations that they said, oh, we might have made a mistake. We might have another three to four billion, which we didn't count previously. Now, I'm telling you, that's a, that's a big, big thing for the energy system. If we have another three to four billion suddenly there, which weren't there before, trust me, that changes our perspectives tremendously. Uh, conservatively speaking, uh, the demand for energy will grow by 30 to 60 percent. Some people say it might be double. Uh, and that is actually driving a lot of what's possible or not possible. If we talk about a sustainable future for the planet, it matters if we have a planet which needs double the energy of today 
or one which can do with half of the energy of today. In one case, I need fossil fuels to actually, actually satisfy demands. In the other case, I can do it with renewable energy. So demand matches. And how you behave, how much energy you save matches in that respect, even in Austria. Because, and I see a lot of young people here, and I'm a professor teaching young, young students, and they all are for uh, renewable energies, but their own lifestyle is actually very, very energy intensive, much more so than that of their parents. So you should think about that next time you've got three things switched on at the same time in your typical multitasking uh, environment. CO2 emissions are still growing. We're here after 15 years at least of combating climate change and CO2 is still growing. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? Have we been so miserable in uh, recognizing the problem? Uh, is it the big, bad capitalist uh, corporations which are stopping all efforts? Are they doing this on purpose? Uh, or uh, are we actually dealing with system failures, which I try to convince you that that's what it is. Our systems and institutions are not set up to deal with some of these transformational challenges, and we need to start thinking about changing the systems and the institutions in order to actually achieve what we want to do with our visions. And last but not least, it also is a question about money. And it doesn't matter if it's truly 20 trillion or 27 trillion, or if it's 40 or 10. Quite honestly, it's a lot of money. And it's a big mistake to continuously shove it aside and saying it doesn't matter. We're talking about the future of the planet, money doesn't matter. That is a philosophical, it's an ideological position, but it's not something which actually uh, has uh, any positive impact if you talk about what do we need to do. I actually recently read for all the uh, ecologically uh, exposed scenarios for the future of energy from the World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, uh, any other inst uh, institutions. And the one thing which, which, uh, which struck me as coming from industry, there's nothing or hardly anything about costs in there and how are we going to do that, which is totally out of line how we live otherwise. Your lives are still completely, to some extent, also determined by the economics of the system. You don't want that? Fine, then we need to change the system. But at the moment, it's there. And only having attack talking about it, doesn't change the system. Look at this slide. It shows you where you have people with no or hardly any income in the light colors. And the blue areas are the rich areas. That's you, all of you here. Uh, basically, uh, you need to actually expect that the people who live in the areas which have low income want to aspire to actually better themselves. And that is a huge driving force. If you talk to the, to the people in China, to India, they will tell you that we have 400 million people lifted out of poverty. I have another half a billion to go. And yes, I know I've destroyed the environment in the process, but I will continue on this path until I see a way out of that. Because poverty is the worse enemy to my people than at the moment uh, CO2 emissions would be. And you need to realize that Austrians, that this is happening. This is not something uh, which you can shove aside because CO2 is a global problem and not a local one. I know that here we talk also about poverty, but trust me, when we talk about poverty, it's a very different thing than what you see in some parts of the world. You see this? You know what this is? This is fracking and shale gas. As Europeans, we just say we don't want it. I agree. This is a reason, this landscape, why we shouldn't do it in Europe. There is no need for us to do it. But we can't ignore that it happens in the United States. This is a picture from the United States. They do it. They have their reasons for doing it, and it's not going to go away. But just ignoring it, closing our eyes and pretending we're invisible, that's what you do as children when you lie in bed. But you can't say this is not happening. And you know what it does? Peak oil is not happening. It, by the way, peak oil was never there. It was complete myth of the media. No proper scientist of any renown had ever said, uh, it's looming. Yes, of course it's there, geologically, theoretically. It's not going to matter. The Stone Age didn't end because of lack of stones, and the Oil Age will not end because of lack of oil. 
because we will choose to not produce oil. And I hope we will choose that very, very soon and within our lifetime, but let's not pretend that things are happening uh, and, uh, which, when they aren't, because this is important. This is the last thing I show you on, on this sort of uh, insights from real data. It shows you the difference in energy prices between the United States, Europe and Asia, and it's here to stay. And now we can get threatened and ignore it again, as like many of our politicians do. But we also could see this as a challenge and opportunity. An opportunity for saying, OK, if Europe is in this position and we have three to four times the costs of the Americans, we can't change that. We don't want to do the same they do. What do we need to do now in order to deal with this, to prevent our industry from leaving Europe and going to the United States? 100 billion capital has flown there already in the last uh, five years. So what is it? I think we need to challenge our young people. We need to challenge our research institutions. We need to challenge our politicians to think about this and address it. And, and good words, nice words about uh, competitiveness is not enough. I want to see real action on the ground. Why is there no research money? Why is it that we have trouble getting one billion for universities? Is that too high a price to be paid? If you look at this, how can you expect 20,000 jobs in Styria to stay in energy-intensive industries if you're not willing to invest in schooling, universities and research so that you can deal with this problem? If you don't do the actions, don't be surprised if the companies will move. They have no choice, because I told you before, money is still there in the system, and as long as we don't abandon that, it will actually have an impact. And this you cannot ignore. And you should talk about it. You should talk about it aggressively and positively, and not only see it as a challenge. This is Germany, and this is the renewables in Germany. Nobody can claim that Germany as a nation doesn't try to do the right thing of energy transition. They've covered the whole country with it. And you know what? They're failing. They will not meet the targets of the energy transition. The CO2 is going up because they're using more and more coal. And it's part of a completely daft energy policy by politicians who didn't understand the system. They just did something. Exit out of nuclear. 12 gigawatts nuclear, and they've got 60 gigawatts of coal in the system. Now they can't go out of coal. Not at the same time. Big problem. Watch online how Sigma Gabriel actually was discussing this with Greenpeace yesterday. He did actually a pr pretty good job on it, and I recommend you to go there and look at it. He just told them, there are facts. I cannot go out of coal. And that means they're missing their targets. Did you know that? So what are the challenges? Energy transitions need uh, new infrastructure. And guess what? You don't want it. You are the ones, and your parents, and your families, who don't want new power lines. I remember the 380 k, uh, kilowatt uh, kV line discussions here in Austria. I remember the discussions in Salzburg. Well, you can't have it either way. Either you want the renewables or you don't want them. If you want them, you need to accept the new infrastructure. It doesn't come for free. Secondly, you don't want high prices. Well, I have news for you. If you build new infrastructure, you have to pay for it. Nobody else is going to do it for you. And by the way, don't make these milk, make, uh, milk made calculations of calculating yourself rich and saying it's not going to cost anything. Oh, well, it will cost you. It will cost you at least 30 50%. And in Germany, it already costs you 50 60%. And there are another 30% waiting to happen, which nobody has told the people yet, because they're afraid of their reaction. There is an enormous lack of, of knowledge around, of competent knowledge. We don't, we don't bother to actually get informed because it's a complex issue. Emotions rule. You cannot discuss energy without emotions. Actually, a former German minister said that. He said it's completely impossible to do that. And last but not least, there is a lack of trust in large corporations and political system. That is poison. That's absolute poison. If you do not trust large corporations, we will fail with the global energy transition. Because trust me, small-scale farming communities are not the solution for the globe. They might be a solution for Eastern Styria, 
but not for the global energy system. It's completely stupid to believe that the world can do without larger companies. How large, how they are governed, do we need to fire their management? We can discuss that, but we will need them. We will need the expertise they have, otherwise we are failing. It's one of the big systemic failures of the energy transition that we have pushed these companies in Germany to the border and said they're bad. So the EERNs, the RWEs, the EMBWs are now in the corner and they don't cooperate with this. If you try to keep it like that, Germany will fail miserably on whatever it has set out to do. And the media are completely helpless in this. Do not trust anything you read in a newspaper on this topic. They had no time to research it and they have nobody working for them who has got the slightest idea what they're talking about. So, what is my outlook to come to a timely close? I think we're at the beginning of a very far-reaching phase of societal, technical, economical and political transformation and change. This is going to create a lot of upheavals uh, in the world as we know it. It will take a lot longer than we think. We're not going to be finished in 2050 with the energy transition. Who has said we need to? That's an arbitrarily taken uh, date. I can tell you that I can't have a sustainable energy system in 2050, but I can have one in 2075. I've, I'm a director at the World Energy Council. We, when we calculate that, we can see that. So who cares? So I'm 10, 15 years later. Fine. I'm not worried because a lot of this will take us until 2100 anyway. Current institutions cannot deliver. People, we need to change the institutions. We, there is nobody who can govern climate change. The IPCC is a, is, a, is a very, it's the best we have, but trust me, I know the workings of it, there is a hell of a lot wrong with it. And they are not in any, any position to enforce the things we need to do. We need to have new institutions, but they are very slow to emerge, because we are not cooperating internationally at the moment. If you watch this, we are fractioning again in old political blocks, and confrontations are increasing. What is extremely important that we teach our children and the young people is system knowledge and the knowledge about how one system actually interacts with the other. Politicians believe they can change the economic system. No, they can't. They can influence it, they can, they can destroy it. They can't truly govern it. System theory will tell you that they can inspire that system, but they will not themselves be able to change it. And that's what you see right now as a backlash. And I think you need, we need to change the way we think about things, about the world, before we actually can change the world in, uh, into uh, any representation of our vision. So you need to sort of get rid of some of the notions you have, who is good, what is good, what is bad. For example, you want to have a renewable energy strategy, my last word. You start with a strategy on coal. You don't start building endlessly wind farms and photovoltaic. You start thinking about what do I do with the 60,000 people working in coal in Germany at this moment in time? How do I give them a perspective? And once you have done that, the rest is easy. Thank you very much. <laughs>